We'll begin with member statements. The member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning. This is my last member statement for 2021. I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you to Jewish community members, leaders, and friends in St. Paul's who welcomed me into your home and synagogues in person and on Zoom, celebrating Hanukkah and holding close its many lessons of gratitude, resilience, belonging, community, and family. I wish you all continued blessings as the Festival of Lights comes to a close this evening. Additionally, I want to wish my community of Toronto St. Paul's happy holidays, happy winter solstice, Merry Christmas, and also a happy Kwanzaa. Kwanzaa will begin the day after Christmas and will continue till January 1st, New Year's Day. May we all take a moment to reflect on the seven principles of Kwanzaa, unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. We must now more than ever. Our challenges this year have been significant. Many of us have experienced devastating loss. Our families and friends have been tested. Essential workers in our community continue their heavy lifting. This holiday, as we get our homes and hearts ready for the season, still in a grip of a pandemic, may we remember those who last night in the cold Toronto rain slept outdoors. To the government, they will have no home for the holidays. I wish you the clarity and conviction to know that no amount of upholding institutions that arrest dehumanize and evict people who experience homelessness or their advocates and allies will get them housed. Everyone deserves a home. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Over the past 10 years, demand for MRI services in Ontario have increased on average by approximately 4% annually. It's why a key part of our government's commitment to ending hallway health care includes a $30 million investment to expand MRI services for patients and add new MRIs in hospitals across the province. It's also why I had the privilege of announcing a 50% increase in funding for the Niagara region's MRI services, with new operational funding for an MRI machine for Niagara Health this past November. A move that will help reduce wait times for diagnostic imaging in our region and put patients and their families first. As part of a wider comprehensive surgical recovery plan that will provide patients with the care they need, this year the Ontario government is expanding up to $324 million in new testing uh, services to provide more surgeries, MRI and CT scans and procedures, including on evenings and weekends. The investments that were announced will bring additional MRI services to Niagara, reducing wait times and making it easier for patients to receive the care they need closer to home. The release of our fall economic statement will confirm our commitment to protecting people's health. In Niagara, this also means a commitment to two new hospitals in Grimsby and Niagara Falls. It means important services for current hospital infrastructure and health services. And as a strong advocate for Niagara, I'm very pleased to see that November's announcement means an additional MRI machine in Niagara to end hallway health care and reduce wait times for di diagnostic imaging. Thank you very much, Speaker. Member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. Last week, the Auditor General blasted the Ford government for not having a coordinated strategy on homelessness and for its out of touch funding based on old StatsCan data about housing need. I'll say, everywhere, homelessness is skyrocketing. Rural and small communities that have never seen unhoused people before are begging for help. Shelters and shelter hotels are full. There is simply nowhere for people to go. Cities across the province are seeing park encampments grow, and often their response is to clear them violently, which, of course, does nothing to house people and serves only to further traumatize residents and their supporters and to criminalize those who work to keep unhoused people warm, fed, and safe. Recently, black Muslim youth in Hamilton doing that work were brutally arrested. One woman had a police officer kneel on her neck in exactly the move that killed George Floyd. Her hijab was ripped from her head. Community leaders and academics alike are calling for an investigation and that the charges against the volunteers be dropped. The violent clearings in Hamilton echo similar events in Toronto this past summer, and they do nothing whatsoever to diminish the homelessness crisis. Governments shouldn't be relying on volunteers to literally keep unhoused people alive and then punishing them for doing that work. We need to build housing and we need to provide community and care to unhoused people in ways that work for them while we build that housing. We need a homelessness strategy. We need it desperately. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Mississauga Malton. 
Speaker, Mr. Speaker, during November, communities across Ontario celebrated Hindu Heritage Month for centuries. The Hindu community has made significant contribution in every field, including philosophy, astronomy, mathematics, science, law, architect, and arts. Sanatam Dharm is based on the principle of Vasudev Kutumbakam, which in Sanskrit means the whole world is one family. This beautiful principle, if followed, will result in love and affection for each other and create a seamless society. I am pleased to join flag raising at Brampton City Hall, organized by the founding members Amit Bhatt, Anand Ayer, Anil Sharma, Ashwini Agarwal, Dave Kapil, Don Patel, Jake Thir, Madhusudan Nama, Madhu Sharda, Manan Gupta, Nick Mangi, Pratik Shukla, Piyush Gupta, Rakesh Joshi, Subhash Chand, and Virinder Rathi of Hindu Heritage Celebration Foundation. I also had the opportunity to celebrate Hindu Heritage Month at Iskhan Temple, Hindu Sabha Mandir, Hindu Heritage Center, and by Hindu Federation at Mississauga Ram Mandir in my own riding of Mississauga Walton, where Pandit Rupnath Sharma reinforced the value of nonviolence, ahimsa. Thanks to Hindus across Ontario for their amazing Ontario spirit during COVID-19 to help the communities for raising funds for neighbors, donating meals, providing PPE, and supporting our seniors. Let's continue to celebrate every culture and heritage and build a prosper and inclusive Ontario. Hari Om. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Point of order, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek unanimous consent to be able to wear tie cut uh, jerseys and memorabilia in light of winning the Eastern Finals yesterday and to congratulate the tie cats and wish them luck in the Grey Cup next week. Oski wee wee. The Hamilton Mountain is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to wear tiger cat sweaters and attire and uh, to celebrate their win. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Member statements. The member for Timmins. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, winter is upon us, and we're as Northerners and as Ontarians, we're used to uh, winter conditions. But what we can't get used to is the conditions of the highways. Uh, over the years, first under the Harris government, then under the Wynne Dalton McGuinty government, we've seen increasing privatization when it comes to how we clean our highways and the circuit times have been affected as a result of all of those changes the circuit time that it takes a plow to start at one spot and then come back again those times have increased and as a result they've been uh, it's been thank you thank you very much the next statement the member for Ottawa so very much speaker Ontarians have really stepped up over the last year since the beginning of this pandemic they're getting vaccinated in record numbers they've followed public health advice and they depend on the government to do the things that they need to support them to be decisive and to act quickly and that's been a real challenge at some times in this pandemic right now we're vaccinating our kids. We need to do more to fight the anti-vax information that's out there, the anti-vax protest. There's going to be one tonight, one rally in Whitby tonight. There was one planned last night in Oshawa. We're not doing enough to help parents and protect parents and kids from anti-vax misinformation and anti-vax harassment when they're just trying to go to a clinic to get a vaccination. Speaker, this government has to take action on safe zones around vaccination clinics here in Ontario to protect families, healthcare workers, kids from harassment. And we have to do more to combat the kind of anti-vax misinformation that we're going to see in Whitby tonight. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to mention the amazing work happening at the Why Not Youth Center located in Brantford Brant. The Why Not Youth Center is vibrant, inclusive, and in their own words, sometimes a little loud, as I found out a few months ago when I was there uh, listening to some of the music that the youth had created in their facility there. 
with dozens of teens on site at any time. There is a variety of simultaneous activities to take part in, including karaoke, pool, just dance, video games, board games, lounging, arts and crafts, or anything else that the group can come up with. Free of abuse, judgment, and harm, the Why Not Youth Centre offers a plethora of entirely free, free resources that are available to youth. Now, Why Not just opened a transitional supportive house for four young men from the community. It will teach them how to be housed, how to pay bills, and life skills. Why Not has been on the forefront of combating youth homelessness for years. I wanted to just come here and say thank you to Charlie, to Susan, and to all of the volunteers and community organizations and supporters involved with purchasing a former drug house and getting it in ship shape for the four youth that moved in yesterday. Again, thank you for all that you do. York Thank you. Speaker, I rise today to sadly mark the passing of a long-time York Southwestern resident, business owner and community champion, Harry Van Kamm. Harry passed away suddenly of a heart attack at 8.45 p.m. on Thursday, no November 25th. Harry was the beloved owner of Golden Crips Fish and Chips, a business that has operated in our community for 60 years. He leaves behind his wife of over 30 years, along with five children and four grandchildren. According to his family, 20 minutes before the heart attack, after hurrying home from work, Harry was cheerfully riding his bike, ringing the bell and singing. According to his wife, Judy, Harry would always say fish and chip was just one aspect of the business. For him, it was about connecting with the people that made it so much more for him. I'm grateful to have known Harry and enjoyed our many interactions over the years. Harry always had a smile on his face and encouraging positive outlook on life. The York Southwestern community loved Harry and Harry loved them back. His passing is a great loss to our community, but we are all thankful to have known Harry. He truly left his mark. The York Southwestern community is mourning along with his family, and I pass my sincere condolences to them. We thank you, Harry, for all of your joy you have given to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements, the member for Oakville. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, this is a joyful time of the year. The Christmas and holiday season is here with towns decorated and li with lights and holiday events taking place. Family and friends will be gathering to celebrate. While this is an exciting and festive time, we also need to think of those in need. In every community, the generosity of Ontarians is demonstrated. There are many opportunities to give to those in need. I want to mention the fantastic work of the first responders within Halton, who are always there when we need them. This week, in my riding, the Oakville Professional Firefighters Association, in partnership with the Town of Oakville, is hosting their annual drive-through drive toy donation at Coronation Park. This free event will occur on Friday, December 10th from 5 to 9 p.m. and will display hundreds of Christmas lights and Santa Claus will be making the appearance to wave at visitors. Oakville residents are encouraged to bring a gift card or a gift as, or a non-perishable food item or an unwrapped toy. The goal of this toy drive is to give every local child the opportunity to enjoy this holiday season. I will personally be there to collect don donations with the firefighters and local volunteers. If you cannot make the event in person, there are other ways to make a difference. The Oakville Firefighters Association will be collecting non-perishable food items, gift cards, and unwrapped gifts at a number of local establishments, such as the Oakville Town Libraries, Community Centres, and Town Hall until December 19th. In Oakville, helping others is what our community is known for. Thank you, Speaker. I understand the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services has a point of order. Speaker, if you seek it, you will find unanimous consent to allow members to wear white ribbons and to make statements regarding the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, with five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group, and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government, after which the House shall observe a moment of silence in tribute to the victims and survivors of gender-based violence. 
Ms. Fullerton is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to wear white ribbons and to make statements regarding the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. With five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's loyal opposition, five minutes allotted to the independent members as a group, and five minutes allotted to Her Majesty's government, after which the House shall observe a moment of silence in tribute to the victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Agreed? Agreed. I recognize the member for Toronto St. Paul's. It is my honour to stand on behalf of the Ontario NDP caucus as the critic for women's issues to commemorate this important, however tragic, day in our Canadian history. Today marks the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. We remember the 14 women who were taken from us 32 years ago in Montreal as part of the Montreal Massacre. They were murdered by a misogynist, anti-feminist coward because they were women. I also cannot stand in this legislature today without thinking of the many days and nights since December 6, 1989, that Indigenous women and girls, Black trans women, sex workers, and countless other women of colour and those who are experiencing homelessness have been killed by men and others, and again by systems that to this day still value certain lives and deaths more than others. In Ontario, 58 lives were lost to femicide this year alone a number that represents an increase of over 52 per cent from the previous year. Calls to assault helplines nearly doubled through the pandemic. Violence against women is a public health issue. It is not a women's issue. Each life lost and each call made is a reminder that the fight for gender equity, the fight to end violence against women, is sadly far from over. Each call is a reminder, regardless of partisanship, of the work anyone elected into these seats must commit to. The Ontario NDP recognizes this and the many dimensions of what this work entails. Last session, and again recently, I retabled a motion calling for the Conservative government to adopt a provincial intersectional gender equity strategy that includes thorough interministerial gender-based analysis on the impacts of each government policy change prior to the introduction of any government bills, motions, budgets or regulations, with the results of such analysis fully disclosed to the public. My legislation would acknowledge that women, 2SLGBTQIA+, and others at the intersections of race and disability, for example, are disproportionately impacted in negative ways by policies that ignore them. I hope this government will act on this motion. Additionally, we, the NDP official opposition, have been fighting for municipalities' rights to be able to ban the sale, possession, and use of handguns and ammunition within densely populated urban areas and, areas and municipalities. This government has ruled against that ban. Preventing gender-based violence means ensuring every woman and person who experiences violence has access to safe and affordable housing, economic access and labour rights. It means a real commitment to creating the supportive housing we need, not on paper through promises and platitudes, but actual builds. Women must have affordable childcare, a functional family responsibility office within the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services where people actually receive child support, which lifts parents, predominantly mother and children, out of poverty, doesn't simply become a dream deferred. Why? Because poverty is violence. Poverty is violating and it steals dignity. Survivors need a social safety net to help them leave abuse. And all of these needs are further and further away from those who need it the most. We must have permanent paid sick days so people, particularly women, can take personal emergency leave, paid time off, to leave, in, to leave the situations of abuse without the added stress of income loss. We need rent stabilization so women aren't staying in situations of abuse because they simply can't afford astronomical rent hikes. We're seeing across this province, courtesy of vacancy decontrol, unethical above guideline rent increases, another motion of mine that died in this House, and this government's ripping up of rent control in their first year of government. Again, I cannot say enough how critical affordable childcare is, not only for the quote-unquote she recovery, but for women escaping violence. I'd also like to take the time to thank the countless organizations across the province doing heavy lifting. Places like OAIF, Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centres, Assaulted Women's Helpline, Canadian Women's Foundation, YWCA Toronto, South Asian Women's Centre, Imani's Place, The Redwood, 
the Metropolitan Action Committee on Violence Against Women and Children, otherwise known as METRAC. Shelters bursting at the seams, caseworkers, counselors, and others working desperately within broken systems, chronically underfunded and understaffed by this and previous governments, quite frankly, to keep women safe. They may be heroes, but even heroes need consistent and annualized funding. I'd also like to recognize the work of the White Ribbon Campaign. All too often, the discourse surrounding gender-based violence revictimizes survivors. The White Ribbon Campaign creates a space to center men and boys' responsibility to ending violence against women, dismantling the toxic masculinity that has been entrenched in men and boys' psyche that can and has led to these senseless and callous murders of disproportionately women and girls. Since 1991, right, White Ribbon Campaign has pledged to never commit, condone, or what too often happens, stay silent as negative bystanders about gender-based violence. Thank you, White Ribbon, for your Orange Laces Lace Up Speak Out campaign, promoting gender equality and healthy masculinity as men and boys walk and talk, or walk the talk, I should say, of positive allyship. The legacy of the 15 women killed and the many more following must be made more than words or a day of significance or a moment of silence. Their lives should not have been taken. They didn't have to be taken. They should not have been murdered. They should have been here today, dominating in science, technology, engineering, arts, math, thriving in their communities, holding political office, maybe if they chose to, and being loved by their families. These 14 women and the countless others should have been here, but sadly, Speaker, they are not, and that's just not acceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Today, December 6, is a sad reminder. We mark the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. Today, our nation are also continues to process the brutal reality that another incomprehensible act of hate-fueled violence has taken place right here. 32 years ago, 14 young women were murdered at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. As a teenager about to enter university, I remember this. While the brutal act of violence does not reflect the core values and beliefs we aspire to in the communities and in the country that we love and call home, it forces a devastating reminder upon all of us that hate and intolerance and those acts live here too. Today is a sad reminder of the pervasive presence of gender-based violence in our society. We mourn the loss of these 14 women, these bright women whose lives were senselessly stolen. It is incumbent upon all of us to honour their memory by reaffirming our collective commitment to fighting hate and misogyny across society. Around the world, women, girls, the LGBTQ, Indigenous, Black, people of colour, community, and gender diverse individuals experience disproportionate levels of violence and discrimination. Violence against women is a serious issue that does not discriminate. Its victims can be poor or rich, educated or not, of any background. Gender-based violence has been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. A recent report by the Ontario Association of Interval and Transitional Houses has indicated that gender-based violence has increased during the COVID-19 pandemic. Other statistics show that more women and girls have been killed in Canada in the first half of 2021 than in the same period in the past two years. This may be lost in the headlines of the health crisis. In the past 12 months, Ontario has lost 58 women and girls to femicide. These 58 women cannot be ignored or forgotten. These women, many of whom are mothers, daughters, sisters, and uh, deserve justice and continued investment to address gender-based violence so that no woman must experience the tragic reality they faced. Approximately every six days, a woman in Canada is killed by her intimate partner. 
dubbed the shadow of the pandemic, the rise of gender-based violence is a result of increased stress, isolation and aggression. This is a serious public health risk that cannot stay in the shadows and can be prevented. Stopping the violence begins with changing beliefs and dismantling attitudes and shifting norms. It means believing survivors and adopting comprehensive approaches to tackling the root causes. It means affordable housing, childcare, and income security supports. It means believing survivors and empowering women and girls. Speaker, together we can do this. Believe women and know that it's never okay to take her life. Member for Guelph. It's today to recognize the National Day of Remembrance in Action on Violence Against Women. 32 years ago, 14 women were murdered at La Cole Polytechnique. They were murdered because they were women. And the sad reality speaker is that we continue to face a rise in violence against women. The pandemic has made it worse. Police have recorded uh, additional calls for domestic violence, and social service agencies have reported an increase in the severity of that violence. It's a public health issue. It's a human rights violation, and it's a significant barrier to gender equality in our province, in our country. So I urge all Ontarians to take action today and every day to end violence against women, to stand in solidarity with survivors. And I especially want to speak to people who, like myself, identify as man, male. We have a special responsibility to stand in solidarity with women and survivors and to take action each and every day to tell other men that violence against women is never acceptable. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Today in this legislature, we rise together to condemn violence against women and to remember 14 young women who were tragically murdered 32 years ago, simply because of their gender. December 6, 1989 is a day that lives on in our hearts and minds. And on every December 6th, we pause and remember those young women whose lives were shortened by a senseless act of violence. If I may, Speaker, I would like to read out their names. Geneviève Bergeron, Hélène Colgan, Nathalie Croteau, Barb Barbara Daigneault, Anne-Marie Edward, Maud Havernick, Marise Lagagnère, Marie Marise Leclerc, Anne-Marie Lemay, Sonia Pelche, Michel Richard, Annie Saint-Arnaud, Annie Turcotte, Barbara Kluznik Vidaevich, Anastasia Kuzik, Natalie Warmerdam, and Carol Coulaton. While we remember these young women today, it is also a day that we remember the countless other women, girls, racialized and marginalized victims of gender-based violence. Sadly, despite all the work that has been done and the tireless ongoing efforts of legislators, police, shelter, and community workers, the incidence of violence against women and girls is far too common. Since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, Reports have shown that all types of violence against women, particularly domestic violence, has increased. This tragic reality is being felt worldwide and has become so widespread that the United Nations now refers to it as the shadow pandemic. Speaker, as Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, as a physician and a mother, this trend concerns me greatly. 
I'm proud to be part of a government that is steadfast in our commitment to preventing violence against women and is taking action to address this violence in all forms. Speaker, words are not enough. This year, our government is spending $202 million on services and supports, $191 million for victims of violence, and $11 million for violence prevention initiatives. This funding supports emergency shelters, counselling, 24-hour crisis lines, and safety planning, and an investment to enhance the transitional and housing program, uh, housing supports program that helps survivors of violence and reduces pressures on the emergency shelter system. We have also boosted support for rural frontline agencies to increase collaboration and reduce geographic and transportation barriers through the $3.6 million Rural and Remote Enhancement Fund. Speaker, to address the calls for justice in the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, our government released Pathways to Safety, a strategy developed in close partnership with Indigenous communities, organizations, and the Indigenous Women's Advisory Council. As part of this strategy, our 2021 budget includes $18.2 million investment over three years to support initiatives to end violence and address this crisis facing Indigenous people. This important investment will provide access to community supports, enhance resources for First Nations police services for sexual assault, human trafficking, and domestic violence investigations build on existing investments to support community safety and provide additional supports to end violence against Indigenous women and girls. And last year, our government launched our five-year strategy to combat human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children and youth. Our comprehensive action plan includes an across-government approach that is focused on raising awareness, early intervention, protecting victims, and holding offenders accountable. Speaker, violence against women is more than just a woman's issue. It is an issue for all of us, and we need strong women supporting vulnerable women, and we also need all people supporting vulnerable women. I know all of us in this House share our government's enduring commitment to prevent violence against women and girls. And we will continue to work hard across government and with our partners to prevent this violence because every Ontarian has the right to live in safety and in a society dedicated to equality and opportunity. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask members to rise to observe a moment of silence and tribute to the victims and survivors of gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Members may take their seats. <clears throat> I 
I'm very pleased to inform the House that Paige Serena Nerona, who is from the riding of Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill, is one of today's Page Captains. And we have with us today at Queen's Park her grandmother, Dora Nerona, and her father, Trevor Nerona. We're also joined today by the father of another of today's Page Captains, Eleanor Carter, who is from the riding of Parkdale High Park. Richard Weiser is here. Welcome to the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. We're delighted that you joined us.